And this is really the embodiment of what we call the, the 15 or 20 minute city principles, which is basically being able to access all of your daily needs within sort of 15 and 20 minutes. My name's Dan Jestico. I'm Director of Sustainable Design within Savills Earth. From Ackroyd Lowry, I'm Oliver Lowry. And I'm John Ackroyd. And this is Urban Forecast, the show where we talk to the people defining the future of our cities. We discuss their background, what drives them, and the insights they've learned along the way. This is a podcast for anyone who's interested in how we live, work or play in the cities of the future and what that means for the built environment today. So Dan, uh, we've obviously met on some projects before. Um, it would be useful just to know a bit about your background and kind of how you, uh, how, how you got to this, this role that you're in currently. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a good place to start. Um, so my, my background is in engineering. Um, and basically, fresh out of university, um, one of my first jobs, I got a job for what's now the Mercedes Formula One team. Um, I was working on aerodynamics for um, for Formula One cars, trying to make them go faster, you know, trying to um, beat all the competition. Back then, they were known as BAR F1. Um, they weren't as successful as they are now, and I don't think that my departure had anything to do with that meteoric rise um, to success. <laughs> um, but I've worked with them for about four years, um, decided that perhaps motorsport wasn't the most sustainable thing to do in the world. Um, so I used the, the sort of skills I gained around sort of a numerical analysis, analysis um, heat and fluid flow transfer modelling and things like that, transferred it over into the world of environmental engineering. Um, I got a job with uh, engineering consultancy Hilson Moran. Um, and I worked with them for about 12 years doing, um, you know, energy analysis, uh, pedestrian comfort analysis, lots of stuff around building energy, um, environmental performance of, of new and existing buildings. Um, and um, after that, in when was it? In um, 2014, got a job with Iceni Projects as Director of Sustainable Development. I was there for about six years and then I joined Savills about 18 months ago um, to um, participate and help run the newly formed Savills Earth division. Can you tell us a little bit more about Savills Earth? I mean, yeah, we'd like to hear about what, what Savills mm. is doing as a big consultant in the UK. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, um, so Savills Earth, as I said, relatively new part of Savills. Um, what we've done is basically bring together a lot of existing expertise within the company on issues such as energy and renewables, um, organisational sustainability, rural um, offsetting, um, biodiversity, um, as well as uh, energy procurement um, and health, well-being, social value, all sorts of things that are to do with sustainability. The new bit of Savills Earth, which is 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 the bit I, I sort of help to run, is the sustainable design piece. So that is basically um, looking at both new and existing buildings and how they can be designed and retrofitted to be sustainable, low carbon, and aligned to the government's emerging vision around sort of net zero carbon strategies. It's an interesting point to jump straight into. What is this government's strategic vision for net zero or or anything to do with sustainability? based on the fact that today is the day of the new slightly bonkers budget. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't read it all. Um, I haven't sort of looked at the detail of it. But even through the um, Conservative Party leader hustings, it was clear that the, the issues around sort of the climate emergency were going to be at the forefront. Um, and despite some contradictions, I suppose, in some of the emerging policy from both Sunak and Truss, um, you know, they, they, they were both committed to the um, 2050 national net zero carbon target, which is obviously very, very good to see, um, because essentially it is our carbon emissions that are the problem. You know, there's obviously lots of issues, you know, around biodiversity and ecology and all these sorts of things. But essentially, mankind's biggest problem today is, is the climate crisis um, and decarbonising our, our society um, is, is the, the key to that. So, you know, um, in light of kind of the recent um, energy price rises that have been driven by the war in Ukraine, um, the government's clearly looking to um, try and reassure us all that they can secure um, low cost um, and uh, low cost and low carbon and um, uh, locally produced 
um, energy supplies. Now, you could argue that with the announcements on fracking um, and other such sort of um, North Sea exploration licensing, that might not be going in the right direction. But um, yeah, we remain to see, it, it remains to be seen what the longer term strategy looks like for decarbonising our energy system, because at the moment it's not exactly clear how these policy objectives are going to help us deliver um, net zero carbon um, in the long term. Maybe it's just a series of um, short-term policy um, quotes designed to win some votes. Who knows? So, yeah, is that one of the challenges that, that there isn't exactly a vision? There's a sort of goal um, of um, 2050 net zero. But there isn't actually a kind of, uh, I don't know, action roadmap. Or roadmap, yeah, to kind of get there. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the government published a net zero strategy um, last year in October. Um, and that that basically didn't take us all the way to, to 2050. Um, it, uh, there were policy gaps within that. I mean, we don't ex- expect a detailed policy map setting out everything that's going to happen between now and 2050, because that's you know that'd be that'd be way too much of a long term plan. But they, they, they did contain a, a few kind of key objectives in there, and perhaps most of the, one of the most fundamental things in that is the intent for our electricity supply to be completely decarbonized from 2035 onwards because that would mean that anything that's plugged into the electricity grid will be zero carbon by proxy so your car um your computers your lights anything that runs on electricity your heavy manufacturing you know you could you could, like it is the most obvious way to do it because it's if, if you could if there were you know if, if you crack that nut of being able to produce all the electricity yeah, without carbon, then plugging into that system, grid for everything, including the production of building materials, for instance, would yeah. have the biggest impact, I, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. Now, it's essentially around in and around the UK, we have abundant resources of renewable energy. We've got lots of wind. We've got lots of space for solar, um, you know, both on and offshore wind, which, which we can probably um, discuss in a bit more detail later. But we've got lots of opportunities for renewable energy generation. And we've got lots of demand for it. The bit that we don't have is the infrastructure to connect the two. So you might have seen recently in the news the potential um, cap on um, new development to the west of London because we've run out of electricity, electrical capacity in that area. So basically connecting the, the um, production and uh, consumption of renewable electricity is going to be a major problem for um, the electrical grid in coming years. Why? Because it's just hard to plug in, plug in multiple... It's easier to produce it in one place than it is to distribute the production. Is that is that the reason? Yes, that's right. And because um, the the way in which our um, our DNOs, uh, uh, the network operators, work is on a, a demand basis. So you basically have to ask for the capacity before they'll build the capacity. There, there's no sort of long term strategic thinking. So if you're basically um, building a development of say 500 homes, and you kind of use up 99 percent of the capacity. The next person comes along and then builds 10 homes. That means that they um, breach the existing capacity. They have to secure the, the, this, the additional capacity, and that means all the new infrastructure associated with it. So it is done on a demand-led basis, which means that there is a lag between the provision of infrastructure um, and the, the, the ability for new homes, new businesses, new um, leisure uses to connect to that, that low-carbon supply. That's really interesting, actually, because we're seeing that on a lot of our projects where we're having to shoehorn in substations and other kind of equipment where the current network is just not up to scratch, particularly in London, we're finding and that, you know, that whatever the previous development has just meant, it was OK when we did the initial searches and then 12 months later or whatever, you find that you, you've got a problem. So I was wondering, what would you suggest as an alternative uh, way that might be a bit more uh, what would be a strategy to mitigate that impact yeah. um, good question lots of people ask us that um, so so first and foremost is investigating what the, the the local grid capacity is right at the early stages of the project because if you, if you find that you're going to get stung for a five million pound substation um, as part of your development that, that, that could obviously affect the viability um, of, the, of the scheme um, and if you find that there is a, as a capacity headroom issue, is really trying to work out what you can do to mitigate that demand. 
So obviously, as the government is encouraging us to electrify um, everything, basically, and move away from fossil fuels for, for heating our homes, fossil fuels for powering our cars, you know, everyone's plugging more and more stuff into the grid. So what we can do to mitigate that demand um, is, is kind of critical. So at a building scale, what it might mean is things like looking at how you reduce your energy demand. Now, obviously, given rising energy prices at the moment, that is a, a, a sort of really kind of hot topic. Um, and more and more people are looking at things like passive house design, um, passive house accreditation as a means of reducing the energy demand from buildings um, and reducing the subsequent demand on the grid. Um, people are looking at things like uh, demand side response technologies. So can you imagine um, the, 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 your worst case scenario, which is sort of on a cold December evening, everyone gets home from work, um, they plug the car in, they turn the air source heat pump on, they go in the house, they put the kettle on. So suddenly your demand is massively peaking. Um, but that peak doesn't really happen for very long. So demand side response is all about trying to mitigate that peak and saying, you know, can you turn off different appliances both within the, 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 the building and within sort of wider industry to reduce the peak elsewhere so you can accommodate those different uses. So, for example, your, your freezer doesn't need to be on all the time. Your freezer doesn't need to be on all the time. If you turned it off during those peak hours, you would reduce the, the, the demand elsewhere, which would give you that headroom. So demand side response and um, is, is one technology that people are looking at. And of course, um, community battery storage is another opportunity for doing that. So, you know, again, if you've got that community battery that's charged up overnight or during the day when people are out of their houses, then again, you can provide a degree of um, sort of energy security through that battery um, provision without necessarily investing in um, those sort of expensive substations um, and things like that. So what we're doing is a lot of feasibility and capacity work on, first off, looking at what the, the, the capacity exists in, in local areas and secondly, developing those mitigation strategies to work out cost-effective ways to unlock um, development that might, um, might not happen otherwise. What about for sort of government side? You know, what what would be if if this government are intending that the you know our country is electrified effectively, mm. um, and that's the solution? And we know if again if we can create all this uh, renewable energy, how would how would what would be a strategy to sort of better ensure that demand was in the right locations mm. creatively? Yep. Um, so first, first and foremost, it, it, you know, we need to recognise the fact that the, the vast majority of the buildings that are with us today are going to be with us in, in 2035 and in 2050. So in order to kind of mitigate the impact of new development, we can reduce the demand from existing development. Um, if we can insulate our homes better, if we can make sure we're using energy efficiently on our existing buildings, then that will go a hell of a long way to re reducing the need to build new infrastructure. So a, a, a sort of, you know, and, and I'm not going to be the, the, the first or last person to comment on this, but saying that the, the government has yet to kind of pursue a retrofit first strategy in terms of encouraging people or providing subsidies for people to insulate their homes has been a notable absence from any sort of net zero strategies or any associated heat and building strategies. Because I, I mean, definitely, and I was looking back at the Green Deal and things that were offered, which were some loans, which have all gone now, except for some businesses, I think, can apply for them to get them. So they, that seems to be a massive gap. I, I noticed Sunak reduced um, VAT on insulation and I think um, a few other things very recently. I think it comes into force in March next year. But they, so they, I think what you're saying is there needs to be a proper retrofit policy and maybe funding and or tax breaks to, to, to move that part of the market. Yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, you know, new builds are at zero percent VAT rated, whereas retrofit is um, is full VAT. I mean, you know, the, the the products may be exempt themselves, but the actual works um, that are undertaken are charged at full VAT, which is ludicrous if we're trying to um, encourage people to retrofit. Um, and you're right, the Green Deal um, failed um, because it was too expensive. You know, the, the interest rates that were being charged on that were, were, were way higher than people could leverage through their existing mortgages. So, you know, the, 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 the people who could afford 
um, to do that work could essentially do it as a, an additional charge on their on their existing mortgage. But for people who couldn't afford to do it, you know, the the, the cost of repayment um, meant that the, the 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 measures themselves wouldn't pay back for decades, which just put people off. Because what's the point in having all the invasive work done on your home? People coming in, you know, ripping your floorboards up, changing everything, putting a load of insulation up when you're not going to effectively see a return on that investment for the next 20 years. Um, people just don't have that sort of long-term capital available or that sort of long-term thinking. Mm, no, very interesting. Well, that's one other, I mean, with um, with insulating buildings, I mean, Grenfell was actually insulated to try and improve its performance, but mm. with a product that ended up, you know, killing many people. Um, and so I was just interested in how we, what your approach you think should be to retrofitting buildings when you're going to use more environmentally and fire safe products, you can't always fit them in. Um, And that's another challenge. Yeah, it is a challenge. Um, And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a tragic shame when, you know, the, the, the intention of improving, um, you know, people's health and well-being through giving them warmer homes, through giving them lower energy bills has that, has that, tragic um end consequence like Grenfell didn't you know um the 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 was a whole range of systemic failures in that in that consequence of events that that led to that um awful awful occurrence um so it, it is about making sure that we do have the right regulations controls and responsibilities in place because it's clear that you know in in that instance the specification the signing off um, and you know all the quality controls that should have been done um, didn't happen for one reason or another. Um, and yeah, there, there does need to be appropriate sort of product selection, installation, and inspection to make sure that that these things are um, properly specified, properly fitted, and obviously don't result in any um, you know fire risk. Yeah, so I think that what I think I suppose I'm interested in is it's, it's a complicated area and. For people to actually do it and afford it and actually fix. I mean, A, we're probably not going to get the kind of savings that we're going to get in the in the big new buildings. But if we did a good thing across all buildings, we'd make huge, you know, huge amount of progress, you know, but we might need to be a bit less ambitious with the energy targets or a bit have a looser regulation around some aspects, not fire safety, obviously, but how you kind of implement it. So it's deliverable as retrofit. Yeah, I mean, there is there is obviously um, <clears throat> forthcoming regulation affecting the private rented sector, which basically says that for, for residential properties from 2028, they're going to have to have an EPCC or better. So that is intended to drive energy efficiency improvements in the domestic uh, retrofit. There's obviously there's, there's a non-domestic equivalent to that as well coming in in 2030. But essentially for the home, for homes that are owned outright or mortgaged, there is no sort of policy lever to drive energy efficiency improvements. Now, one of the ideas that's been mooted is the idea of having a stamp duty escalator. So the amount of stamp duty you pay is linked to the energy efficiency of the building. Um, and that could be cost neutral to the treasury. You simply sort of like drive down one bit at the same time as you drive it up. And because the point of moving in is a point when a lot of people do work on property, you could have a stamp duty rebate if you then improve the energy efficiency of that property within, say, two or three years of moving, and it could in. spur a lot of positive construction as well and jobs and expertise. So that we, you know, what I mean, that yeah. we become world leaders in that. So it, you yeah. know, you could have an economic pos- pos- positive aspect as well as an environmental one. Oh, absolutely, because there's there's a massive skills gap um, in terms of doing these installations. Um, again. You know, it comes down to that long term vision about providing the right levels of training um, providing the right level of support to people in the, in, in the right position in society at the right stage of their careers. But then making sure that when they, they finish training, that there's a market for them to go into. Um, you know, you think about all the rows and rows of um, Victorian housing in this country. You know, all of that is single leaf brickwork. If you are going to get to net zero, then all of that needs to be insulated. Um, and that is, is think about the scale of that. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. A huge amount of work. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. So we retrofit first. Then what do we do? 
in 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 the sliding scale of the what are the most sort of important uh, yeah. things in to, uh, for, to develop sustainable cities. I mean, we we agree with you that the re retrofit, whatever levers that people can come up with, they should be applied to encourage retrofit first, and and dealing with that eighty percent of the of the housing stock that's still going to be there in you know eighty years. What what's the next thing that happens? I mean, the new the new build new developments each building that is built now operationally is getting quite close to, to to carbon zero just through the the lever of the building regulations which is good but you know we've talked about this before that that's not that doesn't really give you the full picture mm -hmm. um and and a, a part of the reason that we set up this company we, we we used to work at archetype who are an amazing uh practice in terms of their sustainability agenda and you know i think we're really one of the I suppose the kind of pioneers of and and now do a lot of passive house buildings, but we we just thought solving the problem building by building wasn't quite the the answer, and that we needed to be thinking at this at sort of city scale or, or national scale, really. So, what's the next most important thing that you can do to after retrofit in terms of make ensuring that our, our cities are as sustainable as they can be? Um, so for, for new buildings, I mean, you know, the, the, the technology and the legislation is, is, as you say, is driving the operational energy performance of buildings towards zero. So if you were to buy a new home in, say, five or ten years' time, you'd hope that it would be net zero carbon or very close to net zero carbon. But essentially, as a homeowner, you, you, you know, you don't really need to know that. You just basically move into your home. You want it warm. You want it well ventilated. You want to make sure it doesn't get too hot in summer. And you want to live your life. Um, and where we kind of need to push our thinking now is how we facilitate sustainable lifestyles. So how do we make sure that when you've moved into your new home, that you will not be sort of like driving everywhere, um, not entirely car dependent, that, that you'll be able to kind of um, go, get to work, get to school, get to shops, you know, um, you know, go to the doctor's surgery, whatever it is, get there in an, in, in an easy um and low carbon manner so the real kind of intelligence in in design and master planning really has to come from um a collaborative effort between architects master planners local authorities transport engineers sustainability consultants everyone on the project team to actually think quite quite hard about what sustainable lifestyles will look like from new development so there's this sort of unwritten rule in France that you should never be a 10 minute walk from your boulangerie to get your daily bread. Um, and this is really the embodiment of what we call the, the 15 or 20 minute city principles, which is basically being able to access all of your daily needs within sort of 15 and 20 minutes, um, if possible. Um, and essentially, if you can do that, then, then you know, it, it is about not controlling car ownership, you know, obviously it's a free society, people can own cars if they want, but it's about trying to limit car use um, and, and sort of decouple those two things and make it, essentially make it easier for people to live a low carbon lifestyle um, through, you know, good master planning, good layouts, um, good urban design. Um, then it is uh, the, for people to kind of get in their cars and drive to the shops and things like that. So I guess, is that because transport, once you've driven down operational energy, is that becoming, you know, what are the significant, and you've decarbonised the grid, you know, what's the, is it transport becomes the next? Yeah, exactly. If you look at the the, the sort of local authority um, emissions across, they, they, they sort of break it down into different sectors. And you can see the emissions um, from commercial building uses, domestic energy use, and from transport, and they're, they're split fairly evenly depending on where you are in the country. So, um, you know, clearly tackling um, those transport emissions is, is a significant issue. Now, obviously, as more and more people drive electric vehicles, you know, that and, and the grid is decarbonised, then that should naturally kind of, you know, take care of itself. But there's still heavy industry, heavy heavy transport movements. And there's still the fact that, that you know, um, car transport isn't the most um, sociable or community oriented way of getting around. I mean, you know, if you walk your kids to school, you kind of get to have a chat with the neighbours, whether they're walking the dog, walking their own kids to the school or, or what have you. And it's, it's difficult to do that when you're in a metal box. Absolutely. I mean, I think that also ties in with the, with the point you were saying earlier about the, 
the grid as well, though, because I think they're going to have to, if, if everyone, if you build a new, a billion new car, electric cars, A, that's going to be a lot of carbon just building all these mm. new cars. And then is the grid going to cope with having all that charging of all those new vehicles? So I think, you know, sustainable transport part of the master plan sounds like it's got to be, got to be part of the solution to, to, you know, making greener cities. Yeah, I mean, the, the the position we might end up on and, and where we are sort of driving to with a lot of our clients is basically having two columns on a balance sheet. So you understand the pounds, shillings and pence of your investments, the sort of potential returns and everything like that, but also understanding the associated carbon impact. So, you know, you're not necessarily um, you know, being driven by, by um, shareholders or sort of any investors in terms of, you know that 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 as a main driver, but your understanding in the first instance, you're gaining a better understanding of what those investment decisions are are impacting on in terms of carbon performance, and then obviously in the future as those two become linked, then hopefully the investment decisions will be driving down the carbon emissions in the in 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 terms of the kind of those long term strategic decisions that are being made, um, not just in property but in other sectors of the economy as well. We, we had an interesting uh, podcast conversation with um, a co-living developer called Halcyon. And they, uh, with the co-living scheme, with their model of co-living, the them as the landlord pays the energy bills for the tenants. And it just, it then struck me, I was like, that's a great idea. You could do that in sort of any rental scenario, um, you know, any kind of PRS, because what, what it would, if you had, if you had it, because I mean, effectively the tenants will still pay for it, but they pay it as part of a flattened rent. And so then what it sort of does is incentivize the landlords to provide the lowest energy building possible because they sort of get the margin. You know, if they can squeeze down energy usage, they're they're gonna get rewarded and they can kind of operate at like a larger scale. And I just thought it was it was quite a sort of I don't know if you could necessarily mandate it. Well, you can mandate anything, but like if you know if you sort of flip the model around from each individual being responsible for their energy bills and doing it via sort of larger organizations you probably get better outcomes yeah i mean it's it's an interesting one we would we i'm just um chatting with a um a developer of purpose-built student accommodation a few months mm-hmm. ago and again they've got a similar model so basically the energy cost is recovered by the the, the rents on the student accommodation um and because they don't pay the fuel bills directly, um, they um, it, it drives some sort of perverse outcomes. So people leave the lights on, people turn the heating up <laughs> yeah. to full, and then open That's, the windows. Yeah, I gave my, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't you, there, there is that, and they need to kind of constantly sort of try and engage and educate their tenants about how to use energy effectively within the building. Um, because they're, you know the point they they make is that these are it's the first time a lot of these. Um, People have lived away from home for the first time, so they're not necessarily connecting that that kind of um, responsible um, energy behaviour. So there, there's a bit of education that that needs to go into how people own and operate, um, or how people operate buildings where they're not necessarily responsible for the energy use. That is a good I point. I was ask you that. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. With um, you mentioned a bit about the linking of sort of financial and carbon profit and loss balance sheets almost um and was just interested how, is that about the carbon market or what were you referring to there yeah it is i mean essentially you know the the, the there is a there is a tra- a traded price for carbon so on one hand, if you wanted to sort of claim yourself as carbon neutral as a business or an individual or as an organisation, you can work out what your carbon footprint is. And then you can basically purchase carbon credits to offset that and then you're carbon neutral. Um, now, that's how sort of carbon is traded on the open market where you have a, a sort of cap and trade system. Um, but at the moment, the the price of carbon is is on that market is really kind of too low to drive effective change in most industries. I mean, obviously, if you have very energy intensive industries like like steel, um, for example, you know that that is a significant cost. But kind of working out an appropriate price for carbon, whereby people can um, use that that cost of carbon to make sort of um, 
good investment decisions to drive sort of low carbon behavior. But at the moment, obviously, that's all optional. No one's forcing anyone to become carbon neutral. So it's just about your sort of business decisions and what your your stakeholders and, and shareholders are asking for, really. But that could be increasingly brought in to sort of, I guess that's the idea, to, to sort of rebalance the economy to sort of value carbon as a significant cost. Because it's sort of not yeah. cost really, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and that's existed for a while for, for really um, heavy um, energy users under the EU emissions trading scheme, the EU ETS, but it hasn't filtered down into everyone else. Um, there was the um, a, a, a sort of um, uh, another regulation that, 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 that sort of fell by the wayside. Um, I've forgotten what it's called now. Um, but it was kind of intended to, to, to capture um, more business level um uh, carbon emissions and was going to publish a lead table to show where people were in terms of their relative carbon performance but again um that's sort of fallen by the wayside now as well so retrofit first 15 minute cities good transport at low cost a detailed plan for national net trans zero transition yeah really, it brings it, really it brings us back to that. That, that yeah, was yeah. It, your three points to sort of win this battle the the, the third point um, I think is is kind of the most interesting. Um, you know what what what's what's the meat on the bone of this plan in your mind? Yeah. Um, well, it, it it you know I know I know I alluded to earlier about the lack of uh, you know the the lack of any sort of long term thinking, but essentially if you are going to have a, a sort of national net zero carbon trajectory, then you then you really need that long term thinking. And you know you got you got smatterings of it. You've got investment in new nuclear going on now these things are going to take decades to come online you know they are going to take an awfully long time they're going to cost a hell of a lot of money um so you do do need that that sort of long-term strategic thinking for those big energy projects but you also need to plan for the small stuff as well um make sure that there is a kind of dedicated pipeline of investment into retrofit that people know with a degree of assurance that if i i don't know um if, if if i go back to retrain as a kind of house fitter um, for insulation products that there's a market um, for that skill set and that market's going to be around for a while because people are going to be wanting to do it for whatever reason you know um you know whether there's a, a government subsidy attached to it whether the um, energy crisis is going to drive that that sort of personal investment in um low carbon uh, retrofit renewable energy solutions that sort of thing so whether we have a kind of emergence for um, a profession as a sort of low carbon domestic retrofit person who is capable of kind of delivering all of this stuff with their skill set is kind of to me where where we need that kind of investment and long term thinking. And equally with the I suppose the investments that are going to be required in the in the grid, how how do you think you best get a sort of public private co investment um, strategy on that? Yeah, that's a, I mean that's a tricky one, and that's that's for wiser heads than mine to solve because I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, don't I, I mean I've got colleagues who know a lot about the energy and infrastructure market, so you know they they would kind of be able to explain it better because I, I you know but fundamentally the the DNOs are all privatised, they're all sort of like you know, um, you know, private companies, so you know although they're regulated by Ofgem, they're under no obligations to to you know have I don't know, 10 percent capacity in their network by any given date or anything like that. So they're not, as far as I understand it, incentivized to kind of plan in advance. And their business model is to be reactive rather than proactive because they won't invest unless they've got the capital to do so. And that means taking money up front, then building it, then having people plug into it, rather than that sort of um investment ahead of things and whether you know these companies become a target for uh, patient capital so people who invest in energy networks you know for a long-term return so you know because people are um investments happening in um things like affordable housing because there's a, a, a steady and reliable income stream from that whether we might see a similar thing happening on on grid and renewables um, you know, that makes a certain kind of sense because the investment and the demand isn't uh, going anywhere in the future. So the ability for, for returns on that is certainly there 
um, and will do be will be there for for many years to come. Interesting. You, you mentioned before you 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 thought it would be good to discuss the difference between onshore and offshore wind mm. uh, as a, a renewable technologies. What, what was it that you felt was worth coming back to on that? Um, yeah. Well, obviously, you know the the the, the government is. It seems to have a sort of fairly contradictory policy on on onshore energy. So they have, you know, um, reiterated their resistance to onshore wind um, at the same time as they're kind of opening up licenses for fracking. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to sort of wonder about, you know, what 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 sort of um, energy what, infrastructure what, who funds you might want. Them? Who funds our politicians, I think, is the question that you really want to ask. <laughs> yeah. I want to get into that right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, you know, you, you think about it in terms of kind of energy infrastructure on your doorstep. Do you want a fracking rig or or, or potentially a, an onshore wind turbine? Um, you know, onshore wind turbines are proven. Um, well, they're proven not to cause earthquakes, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's the best they're, part, they're, yeah. <laughs> they are a proven source of kind of... Um, you know, renewable energy generation, they are they are cheaper to do than offshore wind. So it makes it sense from an investment, um, capital investment perspective. Um, but then we have this uh, the, a planning system that, that restricts that. Now, whether or not you may have a system which grants um, temporary planning approval for onshore wind. So, so you build a turbine, it's going to be there for 20 years. Um, then we'll review that and take it down because obviously, you know, by that time you might have a, a, a range of um, new nuclear coming online, which means that the wind turbines and things like that may become redundant. Yeah. So there may be a sort of long-term strategy you could develop, which means that you know some of these um, onshore wind um, turbines could be temporary. Maybe that might appease some of the the, the, the resistance to that. So permitted development for wind turbines. That's a good yeah, idea. that's what I think. Because so. I mean, if it is a real climate emergency, I think we're in my garden. we've got to do some radical things, haven't we? Yeah, I think that, that we've got to challenge that. And so I think you know that is, and, that, yeah. and that's what we see, and that's what we saw with COVID. That was an emergency, and everyone dealt with that pretty pretty quick. Um, yeah. You know, and if it is a climate emergency, then then you'd hope that um, likewise we could you know um, start start seeing some action. Um, I've got one more question. John, maybe John does, but um, as well, uh, the sort of solar solar panel market. I th- when we sort of started our careers in architecture, it, it, there was um, what was it called? There was a grant basically from yeah, think, um, um, a pay a few, tariffs. Yeah, yeah. and that, yeah. that sort of had quite a good impact. Now, and my parents just sort of like looked at trying to get solar panels on the house, and it seems like it's a very cowboyish market with quite weird sort of loan systems. Um, at the moment what what's your thoughts on solar is one an effective method of you know creation of energy in a distributed way and two how how it could be better incentivized and regulated okay um so yeah solar is a great form of renewable energy generation there are no moving parts you fit it and you can effectively forget it so you know it, it doesn't it needs a bit of a clean once a year um, just to get all the bird muck off it but essentially you know you, it, it once you put it on your roof it will generate electricity um you know when the sun shines um even when it's um when it's not sunny when it's overcast it will still generate energy so it is a, it is a very good form of of um renewable energy provision um the feed-in tariff was intended to incentivize the market and it's done so um, loads and loads of people started buying solar. The cost of it dropped. So in essence, that kind of mechanism was was very very effective in driving the take up of solar and reducing the costs. Um, at the same time, the um, the actual production methods have got cheaper. There's loads of kind of um, cheap PV panels being made in in China, um, which you know you can buy. You can put them on your house. Um, I was talking to someone the other day who was saying that the payback periods for solar have dropped. Um, from about 20 years down to a, down to less than down to less than 10 sometimes as little as five depending on how you use the energy so it is um, becoming more and more cost effective even without the feed-in tariff which is pretty much non-existent now um, so solar is a is a very very uh, effective form of, of renewable energy generation it's reliable and it does pay itself back 
Um, but there are, it is a bit of a, a, a strange market out there because there are people there who will essentially rent your roof. So it means that you don't um, pay for the PV panels, but you get some of the benefits in terms of the PV panels that go up there. Um, that obviously does create sort of legal and ownership issues. So if you move out of the house, or if you want to move house, who owns the roof? How does the, the, the sort of ownership of that, that PV um, change? Because essentially the person who's put the PV panels on your roof has a charge on your property. So it makes all of that a bit more complicated. And, um, you know, I, I, I um, would strongly encourage anyone who's thinking about it to look quite carefully at the ownership structures and how all of that's going to work. Um, that being said, there are other means of financing um, rooftop solar. Um, there are local authorities that are, are bringing together buyers clubs for rooftop solar. So they basically aggregate lots and lots of domestic users and then the local authority buys it on your behalf. So you get obviously that, that um, bulk discount deal, um, but essentially it's, they're still your PV panels. So local authority just buys it on your behalf and then you pay them back. Um, which is again quite a, quite a neat way of doing things, I think. So, so yes, there are pitfalls associated with it, but if you kind of think about it, educate yourself, and and sort of look at the market a bit, there are lots of good opportunities for um, you know um, saving energy through solar. If you enjoyed the show, then please subscribe and give us a review, ideally a five star one. And uh, if you want to know more, please go to acroidlowry.com or follow us on Twitter at acroidlowry and Instagram with the same. This podcast supports LandAid, the property industry charity that brings together the sector to deliver life-changing projects for young people who really need it. Visit www.landaid.org to find out how you can help end youth homelessness. <laughs>